Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in studio with my co-conspirator, Scott partner, Bernstein. Partner in crime. <laughs> hey, partner in crime. The intrepid Scott Bernstein. I uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our audio podcast. You can find it wherever podcasts are found. Uh, please follow us on social media. It's a big help when you, when you comment and like our post and, and help spread the word. Uh, pretty excited about today's episode. Very timely episode. Topical. Very topical. It's it's pretty much global news right now. A lot of people are talking about not just guys like us geek who geek out about this stuff. But I mean, it's like the uh, Fox News is having like round the clock coverage on right, this stuff. Right. <laughs> right. So so we have a, a cartel episode today, and we have a very special guest, um, Leo Silva, who is the special agent in charge of uh, the DEA's office in Monterey. And some of our loyal listeners may remember Leo. He's, this, is, he's a, uh, this is not his first time. He's, uh, we were uh, very lucky to have him on a couple of years ago. We talked about the cartels. And uh, Leo, welcome back. Well, it's a pleasure to be back, guys. Yeah, thank you for your time, and we really appreciate uh, you coming back on. We got the OGs from the street, and then we got the OGs with the badge, and that's what uh, <laughs> that's Mr. Right. Silva yeah, is. Yeah, we try to give OG. both sides. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, one of the main reasons why we wanted to have you back on, and, we, and we're grateful that you agreed to come back on, is, as Scott pointed out, this is, uh, you know, a lot of people in the media are talking about this in terms of um, more from a public safety perspective, uh, uh, perspective, not so much like, you know, we like to geek out about the organizations and territories and how the structures work and these institutions work. But let's just start off with just a basic um, public safety perspective. I mean, Scott, you want to remind well, audiences what happened with the, the Americans? Well, a couple of weeks there? ago, you had uh, four Americans uh, that were kidnapped and two of them were killed. Uh, there's I think there's still questions uh, about why they were where they were. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be as sensitive as I can sure. without, you know, victim shaming people. Oh, sure. um, but it, you know, to use a term from, you know, the military, that this particular incident, there was a lot of shock and awe uh, from the press or the media in, in America that you could have seemingly innocent tourists that uh, according to reports these people were there for some type of you know medical tourism uh going to to look at possibly you know sniff out good you know low prices for cosmetic, for, uh, surgery. cosmetic surgery uh and just get you know caught in the crosshairs of this I, I consider it narco-terrorism, and I, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit on this conversation, and we'll get more, you know, deep dive in that. But, uh, and it's just, it's been a, a really absorbed by the news cycle. And then I think there were some other more recent situations that I am not as versed on, but it, this isn't, this is a story that's developing kind of in real time, and, yeah. and uh, there are a lot of people that are, I think... And I don't know if this, and then this is a question for Leo. I don't know if looking at these more, uh, these recent incidents are reflective of the entire, you know, culture of Americans going across the border to Mexico. Uh, is, is this something that is going to be pervasive or is this kind of a, yeah, uh, they're isolated incident? Yeah. How at risk that yeah, might depend right. on how uh, risky. So, so Leo, what are your thoughts on, on this? Like, Americans going, you know, visiting Mexico and getting into trouble with the cartels. Well, listen, uh, the State Department puts out travel warnings for a reason. And you know, unfortunately, this, this incident was highlighted because of the video that came out. I think that's what, what caused more of this shock and awe among viewers. I mean, because you have four U.S. citizens being kidnapped and it's on video. I mean, in the past, that, that's very rare. You don't get to see that. You know, and unfortunately, in Mexico, this happens every day every single day throughout the country people go missing they get kidnapped they get killed and and because these are u.s citizens and because they were caught on video it just went viral i mean because we just never really seen that before you know and i think that's what caused all the excitement and all the commotion but uh like i say this happens every day over there it's nothing new for the citizens of mexico to see this and to be caught up in this yeah that's a good point i, I hadn't thought about that 
we we made this has become more of a spectacle because it was actually documented as opposed to uh, some of the other um, cases. Um, and the fact that they were Americans. I mean, what yeah. Leo's saying is that if you're a, a resident of Mexico, this is as, you know, as run of the mill of turning your television on and seeing the score of the, the local soccer game yeah. is seeing a story on their local news of a, a family being kidnapped and people, you know, innocently falling victims to the, the craziness that is this cartel violence. Right, correct. And like I said, even when I was in Monterrey back in 2008, to, up until I retired, this was happening every single day. I mean, entire families being taken. So, I mean, for Mexico, this is nothing new, but it was caught on tape. And they were lucky that, that they, they had that tape because if not, I don't think they would have found them. You know, yeah. once, once the tape came out and became viral, people in Mexico started moving and, you know, and, and trying to find these, these uh, victims. But if, that, if it hadn't have been for that tape, I don't think, I think we'd still be looking for them right now. Yeah, and uh, Scott brought up something else that's interesting. Like, so, so the State Department has their warnings, but are are some visitors more at risk than others? So, like, what I'll hear from people that I know, oh well, no, I'm going to a resort town in uh, Cancun. Like, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to some place that's sketch. I'll be okay. What do you make of that, Leo? Like, like that kind of attitude. Well, I, I think it's correct. I mean, you know, a place like Cancun is just, it's really a tourist, tourist town. Cancun, Puerto Vallarta, uh, you know, coastal Acapulco. town. Acapulco. Well, Acapulco, not so much anymore. It's gotten pretty dangerous. But Baja California, all those towns, they're, they're pretty much safe. Unless you go off the beaten trail, you know, then you're, you, you might run into some problems. It's just like with any city. But in Mexico, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. You know, e even U.S. citizens have been have been uh, kidnapped over there and just never heard from again and what happens in mexico is is the police don't do anything they don't care they really don't and in this instance i think somebody way up high in the government got these people to move and, and do something it, because otherwise they, they don't care they're not going to do anything yeah i was going to say what do you make of uh this unusual situation where the the cartel actually issued uh what would you say like a a mild apology and <laughs> trying to like contextualize it and uh, well they went into uh, you know cya mode and yeah. you know pr damage control <laughs> mode yeah and they're yeah. a business just like any other business right right that's, what did you make of that leo that is the first time i ever see something like that ever these guys don't apologize for anything they do you know so it's it's very rare I, it's my belief that they were told to do that by somebody high up in the government yeah it, it, it again I, i'm not trying to go down a a right wing conspiracy rabbit hole here or victim shaming. But is there any validity to the fact that th these four people might have been coming over there for things that were more nefarious than uh, just going to, to you know, s search out the uh, surgery prices? Well, it's, it's hard to say. And the only people that can tell us that are the, the, the surviving victims, you know, so it, it's hard to say. It, it is kind of strange that. Once they crossed the bridge, the shooting occurred two hours later. So where were they for those two hours, man? That, that's something that hasn't been talked about. So, I mean, that's something to think about. I'm not, I'm not trying to victim shame either. It's just right. the, the only and people I know that, that really least, tell us that are, are the two surviving victims. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I can't, I don't want to sell myself as an expert on, on this scenario or situation. So please take everything I'm saying, the audience I'm saying, uh, knowing that I'm not claiming to be an expert. But I, I think I'm pretty sure that at least one or two of them had, you know, criminal records that involved uh, drug either possession or intent to distribute. Um, not, I don't think all four of them, but I think at least one of them did, which then also kind of adds fuel to that speculation. Right. It's, it's my understanding that three of the four had, had criminal okay. records. Well, okay. Right. So. Uh, uh, two of the two deceased and the two, one of the surviving victims had a criminal record. But like I say, un unless, and I'm sure the FBI and, and DEA has already interviewed them, them the, the survivors. And um, unless they make it public, we're not going to know what, what really happened there. You know, and I think their story is very interesting. I, I would like to hear what they have to say as well. You know, um, and even let's just, I mean, for argument's sake, 
argument's sake, let's say they were going over there for some nefarious purpose. That doesn't mean they deserve to be kidnapped and murdered. Right. Yeah, of course not. I yeah. mean, well, they're still victims. Yeah. You know, the park, park Hill is very territorial. So, yeah. I mean, or, you know, in, in, in drug dealers, sometimes they try to rip each other off. Maybe this was yeah. the case. It's all, it's all speculation. We, we, we don't know. But, but the, yeah. you know, if you go down there to Mexico and you try to rip off somebody from the park Hill, you're not getting, you're not coming back. You know, it's just that simple. And, and it's my experience also that I, I guarantee you that the minute those folks, the minute they cross the bridge into Matamoros, the cartel got a call from somebody at the bridge and said, hey, we've got some people that are not from here and they're coming into the city. Keep an eye on them. I, I guarantee you that's what happened. Yeah, they have spotters. And <laughs> so you could be a victim of either kidnapping, uh, you know, robbery, if, even if it doesn't have anything to do with drugs. Right. The minute they cross the border, and if, if, you're, if you look out of place or, or something, some, if you look some, somehow, somehow suspicious to them, they're going to know it, right away. The yeah, and to his them. point, people should know that I think crossing the border in a town like that is different than crossing other borders where there are a lot of uh, U.S. You know, vehicle and foot traffic going across borders. I would guess that in a town like that, it's it's significantly less so, so you'd stand out well, more. There is a lot of vehicle and, and uh, uh, foot traffic crossing the border, but they're all with Texas tags and you know license plates that are familiar to them. You know, people that are from that area, Brownsville, Harlingen, or right. McAllen, or whatever. But you get out of state tags. You know, somebody from Illinois or California or whatever. Uh, it's gonna it's a different story, and, and they'll notice it. And I guarantee you, they're gonna notice it right away. Yeah, I think it's it's uh it it's good to contextualize. It's it as Scott points out, it's not about victim shaming, but certain behaviors are are going to put you at more at risk than others. Is right. what is what we're saying. So depending on when you go, where you go, and what you're going, what you're doing there, you're going to spring break in Cancun. I mean, I'm I'm not saying that there's zero risk. Sure, but. It's a lot less percentage wise than going into some of the nooks and crannies of the country yeah. that might, even might be even big cities, but not cities with a lot of American tourism or like uh, uh, Leo saying, if you're not from Texas, you're probably not you're gonna stay coming there. over there. Yeah. So, yeah, you're you're probably raising the risk factor. Yeah, let, and, let me let me mention something yeah, else. Ahead. There's three women that are from this area, from the area that I live in here in South Texas. They're also missing down there and they're, they're U.S. citizens. And they went down there for, for business. They went down there to sell used clothing and stuff like that that they, they sell at these open air markets down in Mexico. It's pretty common. But these three ladies have been missing for over a month and nobody's heard from them or anything. And also, there's, it's my understanding there's a U.S. citizen that was living in Colima, Mexico, and she was taken from her home. And, and, and you know, it's just, it, it can happen to anybody. Uh, it, like I say, it happens every day over there, but it can happen to anybody. I mean, there's, you just don't know. You never know what's going to attract their attention to you and want them to, want them to take you. Is that, is that story getting more attention with the three ladies? Because that's how I became aware of it was through your Twitter feed. Is there more attention to that in Texas? Because nationally, yeah, there's not a lot of people got are anywhere talking, near the amount I hadn't attention even heard of it until I heard about from you. Cases. Right, yeah, I've seen a little bit more attention you know, in the media, but not as much as, as uh, the other, the prior kidnapping. But I think it's getting a little traction. And uh, especially the lady from Colima also, I've seen her on, on national news, her picture out there. So yeah, it's getting some traction. Uh, but I, I'm saying, I think there's a, there was a, a figure put out the other day that there's over 550 U.S. citizens that have gone missing in Mexico. Wow. Have, yes. Wow. And and what it's obviously speculative, but if we could just get into the to the mind yeah. of these groups, um, I know in some cases they might kidnap an American citizen because they have some beef with a family member either in Mexico or the United States, and and that family the the person who's kidnapped might have, not have anything to do with that, but they know this is a way to get at someone they don't like is we're gonna we're gonna kidnap your family member to send to send you a message. That can be a reason why something like this happened. Obviously, I don't know if that's what happened with these ladies. I, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm just going through a hypothetical situation. What might be some other scenarios why 
uh, a criminal group in Mexico would do something like this, kidnap American citizens? Well, if they think you have money, if they think if you if you show some sort of wealth, they're going to come They'll probably come after you to try and extort money out of you and your family. So any appearance of wealth is, is also a motive for them to come after, you know, one of the victims. So that, uh, like you say, a beef or in my case, I've, in my experience, I've seen them if, if they like an attractive woman that's walking down the street just because they, they want her, they'll, they'll pick her up. Just for those are several motives that they use. Uh, if, they, if you owe them money, forget it, man. They're going to find you. They're going to track you down, and, and they will find you. If you lose a load of drugs, they're going to track you down. And they will find you, or your family, or something like that. So, yeah, I mean that's something that I think is underreported and yeah. underappreciated is the amount of sexual assault that's that's going on um, down there, uh, especially near like the maquiadoras, like the factories and things like that. So yeah, it might not even be like something organized crime it might be just yeah thugs i but i also know. think there's it, we're, we're talking about contextualizing I, I think at this point characterizing these individuals as drug dealers or gangsters is just it's no longer accurate i mean these are Fully formed terrorists. These these go it's go so far beyond being a professional criminal or being a drug dealer or being a gangster. Or, I mean, these are this is in what what goes on within these cartels is in is inhuman. I mean, you're talking you're not talking like El Chapo, who's the you know the most notorious uh, narco uh, figure in the world. You're you're not talking about a guy who was a mobster that might have been a, a really bad mobster might have been responsible for two dozen murders. You're talking about a guy that's responsible for thousands of murders. Right. So I just I think at, at a certain point, the media has to start letting the public know that this is beyond anything that they can think about from a movie or anything that's romanticized about. Uh, this type of Robin Hood criminality. It's this is as this is as bleak, you know, and and just human life means nothing. You know, life is cheap is a is a understatement, and and it's it's really uh, it it's beyond like it, it's a it's it's epidemic. Yeah, what what do you make of that, Leo? Like the the like how we how we frame this. Well, I tell you what, it's going to be interesting these next couple of weeks because because AMLO, the president of Mexico, has been hurling a lot of verbal insults over here towards the United States, and and I heard today that uh, the Secretary of State uh, Blinken uh, made a comment uh, under oath saying that he believed uh, parts of Mexico are controlled by the by the narcos, and I, I go so far as to say not parts of Mexico, yeah, I would say all of Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, yeah, so. I mean, it's 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 going to come to a head pretty soon between both administrations, and it'll be interesting to see what what steps they take, what the Biden administration takes towards this problem, because it really is a problem, like you said, it's it's this is a, an epidemic. Well, let, let's let's revisit the, the episode that we uh, recorded with you before for for those our audience that just just watch our uh, videos. Keep in mind we have other audio episodes with with other interesting guests that that you should consider checking out, please. And one of these episodes with, was with Leo. And we had a conversation about one of the groups that you investigated when you were active in DEA, and that was the Zetas. And, and if we talk about terrorism, um, one, one thing in terms of the, the point of a terrorist group is to terrorize the local population. So in that sense, I, I, I agree with this, that, that that's what's happening. I, I think, I think the definition of terrorism is is complicated, and and that's only one definition. And I'm I'm not so sure the other ones they meet the Quiet, standard. Yeah. But in terms of terrorizing the local population, that's that's what a lot of this is about. And Leo, if you could, for some of our audience members who 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 um you know didn't hear our our last episode with you, can you describe some of like the Zetas' tactics to to terrorize the local populations? Sure. I mean, when I was in Monterrey, they would uh, torture people and then hang them and throw them off an overpass. I mean, like five bodies at a time, just hanging from an overpass. And uh, it, it was terrorizing. It was instilling fear throughout the community, not only in Monterrey, but in all of Mexico. 
I mean, they they were beheading people and videotaping it and put it on YouTube and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, just imagine seeing one of your family members being a, a mutilated like that. I mean, it, it's, it instills fear. And even if it's not a family me member, you're still going to be scared to walk the streets because you don't know when you're going to be a, a target or a victim. So uh, the tactics they used were, were brutal, really brutal. And it was meant to terrorize people. It was, it was kind of like you said earlier, shock and awe kind of thing. And they did shock and, they, and, they, and it was pretty awful. <laughs> Yeah, because traditionally, when this was more of like what we think of as organized crime, if they have a problem with someone, they just whack a guy out, right? Or uh, the old way was you bribe, right? You pay the you pay the person off, and and the Zetas really represented a. Correct me if I'm wrong, Leo. A, a paradigm shift that uh, we're not going to have just an isolated shoot a guy in the street or or bribe police officers. We're going to terrorize. The local government, the local people into submission, sub, in, into submission, and and that was pretty different, wasn't it? At that point, yeah, absolutely. They they ruled by fear, and you know all the policemen in, in Monterrey. I'm not saying all of them, but but most of them were on the take because if you did take it, if you didn't take the money, they'll go after your family or they'll go after you. They probably might not go after you, but they'll go after your family, a family member. So you really have no choice, man. I mean, these guys have no choice at times. So it's like the old saying goes, plata o plomo, or lead or, 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 or gold, you know, or silver, silver or, or lead. So right. yeah, some, some of these guys have no choice. And the, the setas did rule by, by, by fear. They ruled with an iron fist. And, and if they executed a rival cartel member, they were going to make, they were going to make an example out of him, you know, by brutally torturing him, recording it and putting it out for the world to see. Yeah, and one thing we talked about last time is I think this is this is important to understand uh, why they would use these techniques is the early stages the Zetas were ex special or, forces or ex cops <laughs> or ex, ex special forces ex military and so these were correct me if I'm wrong Leo these were counterintelligence strategies that you would implement in wartime to to terrorize a population of submission and they and they exported it. Into, yeah. into uh, the drug game. Into the into the drug game. That's correct. Absolutely correct. I mean, you, you have uh, you, you said counterintelligence. There's counterinsurgency also. Counterinsurgency. Yeah, I meant. Yeah, that, yeah thank that's you. What, that's what they use to intimidate. You know, the, the, the Mexican community, not only in Monterrey. I'm talking about the whole country. So, uh, yeah, the, you had snipers. You had guys that were you know counterintelligence, explosive experts. These were the original setas, and and yeah, and, and when they wanted to. To, to make an example out of someone, they they were really good at that. And and then what happened was you had this escalation of violence because then El Chapo and and the uh, and the Gulf cartels or no, well the Zeta started off as a Gulf cartel enforcement wing, didn't they? Or they started off as a as an enforcement wing for Osiel Cardenas, the, the leader of the cartel okay. at the time. Okay. Yeah. So, but the the rivals like Sinaloa and uh, Juarez, then they had to start establishing their own paramilitary groups to, to be able to counter the 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 the, fero yeah. the ferocity of, of the zetas when the zetas were in power they, they those guys couldn't couldn't match up with them man you know, because these guys pretty much had 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 the advantage in the recruiting of these soldiers but by the time these guys wanted to do that it was too late because these guys had already recruited most of the the good uh, the good special forces operatives so they had a lot of catching up to do, and they, and they never really did until, until everybody started turning on the setas, and, and eventually they dwindled down to almost nothing. Yeah, I was going to ask you, my understanding uh, is that the zetas at this point are pretty fractured, that um, almost like the, the individual commandantes, the individual commanders are now all this uh, basically just have their own crews. Yeah. And they're not, not part of a, a larger network. Yeah. Is that, is that your understanding, Leo? Yeah. You know, and that was a strategy at the time when I was in Monterrey, we wanted to chip away at their leadership structure so that it could, we could eventually disband them because once you start chipping away at the leadership structure and they get a replacement, well, that guy's not going to have as much experience as the guy before him. And you keep chipping away at all that stuff. And pretty soon you're down to, to somebody just who's never pretty much held a gun in their in their lives until now so uh, you went from having special forces to just some guy on the street you know running around with with a gun and intimidating people so it's a big huge difference and and that's what 
pretty much caused the implosion of, of the sickness. I think in some ways there's a analogous trend in uh, American organized crime in the last 20, 30 years, where it seems to me that in a lot of these families right now in the 2020s, it, and there aren't a ton of similarities between LCN and the cartels, but just based on what we're talking about uh, of the phenomenon with Los Zetas and, and, and some of the groups that were, were similar, that in, in American OC right now, the loyalty is fractured in a family in the sense that the loyalty appears to me to be more towards the crew that you're in than the overall family structure. And you would literally die for your capo, but for the boss of the whole organization, you don't really care about it at all. Uh, and I, I see that happening in, in other, you know, in patches around, around the American mafia landscape. And it, it sounded just the way that you just kind of explained you know, laid it out for, for what happened with Los Zetas that, you know, like you were saying about the, you know, you're, you're more loyal to your, your commander than the overall uh, paramilitary right. structure. Right. You know, and, and you're right. I mean, it, it happened in Mexico too. I mean, back in the days of Juan Garcia Abrego when, when he was running the Gulf cartel, I mean, it's like you said earlier, I mean, if somebody crossed the, 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 the organization, well, they just dealt with him. They didn't mess with your families or kids or anything like that. And that changed. That changed with the Setas when they came out, you know, because they they just they just totally forgot about that rule and just ignored it and, and went after whatever was going to hurt you and whatever was going to help them get their what they wanted. That that's what that's what they care about, you know, and, and, and they don't care about rules or or being politically correct or nothing. They're, if they if they can they're going to hurt your kid, they're going to do it, and they they've done it before. And is it is it true that the Gulf Cartel is basically on the ropes too, right now? Would you say they're, they, they're they basically fractured. defeated? Okay, they're very fractured. I mean, you have the, the group in Matamoros, and then you have a group here in Reynosa, and then there's another group in Rio Bravo, which is right in between both cities. So it, it's fractured. It's not as united as it used to be under Garcia Abrego and and uh, uh, Osiel Cárdenas. Let, let me ask you a question about uh, criminal justice policy, Leo. If if um, because my understanding is that with a lot of the cartels, even the Sinaloa are fighting each other right now. His, the uh, his sons, what do they call themselves? Los Chapitos. Yeah, that right. They're fighting with the uncle and um, yeah, uh, Ishmael, the El Mayo. Yeah. So even in Sinaloa, there's there's different factions fighting each other. But like from a perspective of criminal justice, Leo. So in in the DEA, in some ways, you you, you could argue that it, it was very successful your efforts because you fractured the dominant organizations there, the Zetas, the cartels. They're 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 breaking up, um, and uh, so in, in some ways maybe they're decentralized. not decentralized. They're decentralized. They're not right. as, as as cohesive. But is there is there a, is there a blowback situation where when these organizations become more fractured, there's an argument that then the, then they actually the violence intensifies because now it's block by block the different crews with the mm -hmm. different commanders, and there's no shot caller. There's no boss. There's no old school Don. Who can say everyone chill the fuck out here? Um, now they're it's like it's almost like gangs, yeah, uh, uh, warring with each other. What do you think about that, Leo? I mean, uh, does that does that frustrate you? I mean, how do you approach that as as a law enforcement agent when you're strategizing how to contain these groups? I would, I would say you're correct. Um, and you know what what happens is a lot of these guys, like I say, you chip away at the leadership, and then you get to lesser experienced uh, people that are in the organization, and a lot of them are young, younger people that have no life experience or very little life experience and they lose focus of what the real goal was of becoming an organization in the first place. And, and for these guys, it was making money. And now these guys, all they care about is like, well, man, you know, I'm going to go kill that guy just to show that I'm, I'm this big shot. Right. They've lost focus of what got them there in the first place. You know, and this is, it was about money. It was about making money and becoming rich. Now they don't, it, was, it just seems like that's out the window. And all they care about is, like you say, you know, I'm going to protect my little block here, and, and that, that's what that's what they're going to do. And they, and, and their 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 focus is something else. It's not making the mighty dollar, you know, as it used to be. Yeah, it's more about like you're controlling your little fiefdom 
uh, as opposed to um, a, a grander organized criminal uh, just conspiracy. The, blo- the bloodlust seems to be, you know, contagious. That if that's the right. environment, if that's the, you know, that's the territory or the terrain that you're walking on and everybody's, you know, life is so cheap. I mean, that, I think it happened. I, I'm sorry that I keep on making these analogies to LCN, but like, you know, when, when LCN was at its peak, the, the power was at its apex, but the body count was also at its apex um, in the, in the sixties, seventies and eighties. And it was just like, I think in Goodfellas, they had a, a line in it. Like at first it was like, you know, there was a reason to kill somebody. Now it's just, you know, guy bumped into me at a party and I want, and, and everybody's killing everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you approach that though? From like, um, I mean, from law enforcement, I mean, if, if you're, if, if the strategy is the kingpin strategy, but then you know that the, the, the organization might end up becoming more violent and more, more flippant about its violence. I mean, how, how would you approach that as a, you know, as a, you know, you were a high ranking person in law enforcement. I mean, I, and I don't know what the right answer is here. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really, you know, asking you in all sincerity, like I, I don't have an agenda here. I mean, that must be frustrating because on the one hand, you can't sit there and say, oh, well, let's just give the leadership a pass because things will be more stable. <laughs> so, I mean, what, walk us through those kinds of conversations with, with your colleagues. I mean, what, what, do you, what, what are the priorities? Well, the priorities is pretty much to stop the violence. You know, that, that's the main priority and, and protect. Our, our priority is always to protect the public, right? As a law enforcement officer, so you know there's there's gang strategies that we use here in the United States, and, and it involves identifying all these guys, you know, pick them up for whatever. If they spit on the street, pick them up. Let's let's get their prints. Let's uh let's uh, photograph them and get their history down, right? Uh, and that's that's one strategy, and it's you got to take it step by step. But once you know who these guys are, and something happens, you know who you're going to go after. So. Uh, that, that's just a small example of, of how gang strategy works here in the United States. And I don't know if it could transfer over into, into Mexico because things are a lot more difficult over there to work. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard, especially in another country. It's, it's, it's not an easy task. Well, and as you point out, you don't always have the full cooperation of local law enforcement, right? I mean, right, that's the understatement of the, of, the, of the night. Yeah, they're they're part of uh, the the local police are the eyes and ears for the for the organizations. So then that's just there's just no other way to put it. That's that's how they operate. Law enforcement in Mexico is an entrepreneurial endeavor. It's not necessarily <laughs> really, a public service or being right, a public right. servant. Yeah, and and that's and, and it goes back to what we we're talking about the kidnapping victims. As a result of that, these guys aren't motivated to go out and find not only these four but the thousands of people that go missing every day in Mexico, they're not motivated to do that. Why? You know, they're not getting paid for that. They're getting paid to protect the cartel. So, so there's, no, there's no reason for them to go out in the street and look for a, your relative who's been kidnapped. They, they, just, they don't care because they're trying to help the cartel and protect the cartel. So, so what would you be your strategy from the perspective of law enforcement? Let's say you were investigating. I know, I know you're retired now, but if you were investigating the disappearance of these, these women from Texas, um, how would you go about like uh, developing sources and Intel uh, because of the precarious nature of that environment? Uh, what, what do you do in terms of trying to, to find these women? Well, the first step that I would take as, as, a, as a law enforcement officer is, is there their uh, their phones the phones who, who, who were they last seen and start trying to go back and trace their phone their phone uh, activity and i mean that's just the first step it doesn't mean it's going to be successful and then you know we have to rely on our counterparts and, and when i was working in mexico well, we relied heavily on the, the mexican marines so once we get them involved and they start asking questions they're, they're pretty good at getting results you know <laughs> so that that would be a strategy that i would use you know because kidnapped anybody, whether Mexican or U.S. citizens, it should be a priority. I mean, you have somebody that's a family member and they're the family. If you don't find them, their whole family is going to be fractured. So it's not just that one victim that's going to hurt. It's everybody, everybody, the friends, the family. It affects a whole bunch of people. So my strategy would be to, to, to first of all, look at their phones, their phone activity, and then get with our counterparts and try to actively 
proactively go out there and, and shake the bushes, as we say in law enforcement. Um, and I, I know we're jumping all over, but I, I, if we can uh, also go back to the conversation about the, the narco terrorism, and I want to see what you and Scott think about this. So um, there is a push now among governors and attorney generals in the United States and in, in some cases, Washington, D.C., to not just conceptually as criminologists, but to actually formally them. designate yeah. them as, as a terrorist group, the, the cartels. And I would say in terms of one criterion of terrorizing the local population, they absolutely meet that, that, that standard. Um, Leo, walk us through, I mean, what would be the advantages to law enforcement? I, I don't know how you feel about this. So you, you could share it with us if you're comfortable, but what, what would be the advantages to, instead of approaching this as an organized crime problem, officially designating them terror groups and going after them as such? Well, the first thing that's going to affect them is is the is the money. And when, once you start affecting the money, that's that's when you start making inroads. So, anyone anyone that's associated with a terrorist organization, whether it's in the United States or whatever other country, you know their assets are going to be frozen. Uh, there's going to be action taken so that they don't do business with anybody here in the United States and uh, in other countries. So those little actions have a ripple effect, and it, it will go back to hurt them. As far as using the military, um, you know, military strikes in Mexico, I, I, you know, that's that's going to be. I don't think we're going to see that ever, you know. But but there's other things that can be done. Uh, you can close the border or make restrictions higher. But but uh, the main thing that's going to hurt them is is money. I mean, how does money flow? You need banks to make money flow and and, and stuff like that. So that that's where it's going to hurt them the most. And and uh, classifying them as terrorists. You know, it's a double-edged sword, man, because let's say, let's say they do, the government does do, classify them as terrorists. Then you're going to have, if the, if the if immigration problem is tough right now, it's going to be even worse if that happens because it, it's going to give them an opportunity to apply for asylum because of the terrorism in Mexico. So, the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, that, that's a big one. Like right now... Um... <laughs> They will not accept you as a refugee under humanitarian circumstances if you're just saying we're fleeing the cartels. Right. They don't consider it because they're not. Ter it's it's not considered a a formal right. political situation. So, um, and and you know some people would argue, well, well, good. Like we we should be have a more uh you know liberal humane immigration. I'm, I'm not saying how I feel one way or the other. I'm just saying that's part of the argument. Um, but as Leo points out, that that can also create other problems from a law enforcement perspective. Um, if you're going to have a whole wave of of refugees now who are going to be, have a legal right yeah. to political asylum, right? Absolutely. And you know, even back when I was in Monterrey, you had a lot of uh, folks that had the means leaving Monterrey and moving to parts in Texas, whether it's San Antonio or Houston or or even here in McAllen or or, or Dallas. Because of the violence over there, but they had there were people that had the means to do it. That you know they could come and buy a house over here. A lot of people don't have the means to do that, so you know they just have to sit there and take it. So one example, though, in terms of a benefit, though, would be financial. You, this would give the government more resources and more leeway to freeze assets. Is that what is that what we're saying? I'm not an expert on money laundering and things like that, so I'm 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 you know asking you know from a. So that would give um, a lot more ammunition, right, at least right. in terms of the going after the, the financial the financial part of it. Right, and, and even now, I mean, even if they're that they're not terrorist organizations, they're not classified yet. Uh, even now, I mean, freezing their assets is, it, it hurts them. And, and we have a in DEA, we work closely with the uh, OFAC Office of Financial. I don't know the, the whole the whole definition of it, but uh, if you get put on that OFAC list. You know, it, it's right away your assets get frozen. Any company you're doing business with in the United States, you can't anymore. So it, it hurts them. I've seen the way it works. And, and people would rather turn themselves in to, to criminal charges than get put on that OFAC list because it affects not only you, but your whole family. Anybody, any relative of yours is going to be on that, that, that we can associate. It's going to affect them too. So yeah, I, I've heard that, that, that that's one of the keys with if you designate them as terrorism. You can, you can really put the screws to them more uh, by going after a family. And basically, anybody who's connected to the person can be implicated in terrorism. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's, it, it, 
in some ways, at a smaller level, it dovetails with 9-11. Oh, yeah. When certain people were designated, you know, terror threats. It, it's a whole new ballgame. You can keep them as long as you want. You can do whatever you want to them. They lose all of their uh, rights as a, you know, as a, as a normal American prisoner. Yeah, or, right. which is which is by the way part of the debate. And again, like I'm not trying to take sides here; just being just being descriptive. Um, is um, that's part of the critique of why we shouldn't designate them as terrorists? Is that is that 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 then that opens up another set of problems? Are you violating people's civil yeah. liberties because just because you're related to a narco person doesn't mean that necessarily you. Or a narco person, but um, will that matter if law enforcement's trying to put the screws to a to a narco kingpin? Um, so it it it, cre- it could create more headaches for just like the border situation. It could end up creating more headaches for law enforcement. I, I suspect. Right, you know what? And I really don't see it happening. You know, in the near future, anyway. I mean, when you had Pablo Escobar blowing up buildings and blowing up airplanes, he was never designated as a terrorist. So. I don't see it happening in Mexico, you know, so I think he did many, many more worse things than the Setas ever did. So, yeah, uh, you know, it didn't happen in Colombia. I don't think it's going to happen in Mexico. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, Pablo literally blew up a civilian passenger jet. That doesn't get more terroristic uh, uh, right. than that. Right. And they still didn't designate. Um, I mean, right. one one thing I would say, see what you guys think, just, you know, I'm, I'm a criminologist. And I like these kind of theoretical discussions is. One of the reasons why I think they do not meet the standard of a terrorist group, even though I agree some of their actions are terroristic, is traditional definitions of terrorism. And, and maybe maybe that needs to evolve, right? Maybe maybe, maybe I'm, I'm sticking to this old-fashioned, outdated model, but traditional definitions of terrorism are you terrorize the population for political ends. Right. There's with, no political ends. Well, there's no political ends here. There's no ideological no, there's there's nothing. No ideological in, I, I would say more having to do with an I some form of ideology. Yes, right. Whether that was right. political or not, it was right. political religion. Right. Yeah. Uh, That's the traditional you know, definition. And I don't see that sovereignty, as sovereignty, you know what? Yeah. No, but, yeah, that has nothing to do with what's going on with the cartel. It doesn't they, seem like right. it. I mean, what do you think no, about it's that, not, Leo? It's it's not really. I mean, these guys the only thing they're loyal to is is uh, yeah. the, the dollar, man. You know, they, they just want to make a dollar and make some money. Even though like I say they've kind of lost focus of what what got them there in the first place, but bottom line, that's what they're after. They're they're not, you know, they don't have some, like you say, political motivation or or, or aspirations for for as an excuse to do these things. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't see that. Yeah, one thing I I think back to a, a parallel with with Italian organized crime is one argument I've made. We'll see if Scott and Leo whether if you agree with this, but. In the 1980s and 90s, when Cosa Nostra in, in Sicilia and Sicily were assassinating judges, politicians, cops, civilians, yes, it was to terrorize the local population, but it wasn't for state capture. It was because they wanted the state to leave them alone. <laughs> they, they didn't want to run the state. They didn't want to capture the government. They just wanted to, to get the government off their back. And I see a parallel with the cartels in Mexico that a lot of these acts of terrorism or terroristic acts it's not because they want to control Mexico. Right. It's because they it, they want the government, the police, to, to leave them alone and let them let, do what let they us want. leave as many bodies in our wake. Let, let right. us rape and pillage, traffic as much drugs, and just uh, you know let us be. Yeah, yeah. they don't want to. My the cartels don't want to run like the electrical grid and the right. <laughs> schools and the things it's not that like, the uh, government uh, do. Uh, uh, Castro, <laughs> right, who wanted right. to take over the country. Yeah, take, and right. It's, it's, they're, they're not revolutionaries. Right. What, what, do you, no. do you, what do you think about that, Leo? No, no, but you know what? The police already leave them alone because they're on their payroll. So they're not worried about the police. That's the least of their worries. They, they might be worried about, you know, U.S. intervention there, but but they've already got, you know, the mayors and governors in some in some uh, states in their pockets so they're, they're never really worried about it. they already run the government in in a they kind of have sort of a shadow government let's say uh i pay somebody millions of dollars to run his campaign and he becomes the governor now he's in my pocket now i can tell him hey you know you look the other way when we're going to do these things and he can't do nothing about it because if he does you know his family's going to be exposed and, and so will he so um, that's the way it works. And pretty much 
There's several states in Mexico that, that have, I mean, just here across the border from us, they've had two governors uh, arrested, arrested for, for being in cahoots with the, with the traffickers and receiving money and bribes. So, I mean, they pretty much they already control the government. You know, imagine having a governor in your pocket. And he's not going to do anything against your organization. And, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's that way across many states in Mexico. Yeah, what do you what do you think about this um more um uh I don't want to say uh conspiracy theory but um this idea back to this ha- having things more stable in, in making a deal with the devil that that there was an advantage to um El Chapo still being in power because and and maybe a couple of the other dons from from the the, the major cartels um that uh they could keep things more stable. And so, you know, I mean, okay, I'll just say it. part of the conspiracy theory is that, is that DEA, CIA, State Department, and the Mexican government were favoring El Chapo. Well, we know that El Chapo. In the, in the, in the, in the war with the, with the other cartels because they felt like at least, the, at least it would be stable. Well, we also know that El Chapo, before he became uh, the, this infamous, iconic uh, supervillain, Back in the early nineties, he was giving. Know, he was giving. He was a, a an opened and fully functional confidential informant for the DEA. Yeah. What What do you What do you What do you make of that? Those well, uh, conversations, Leo. <laughs> First of all, um, you know this, this idea that the DEA and other federal agencies were favoring El Chapo is is I can tell you right now that's that there's no truth to that. I mean, in, in my case in Monterrey regionally, Monterrey is in northeast Mexico. And the people that ruled there were the Gulf Cartel and the Setas. So that's what we focused on. Now, we have an office in Mazatlan, Sinaloa, but it only has like three agents. Three agents, they can't do much over there. I mean, they can gather intelligence, but unless, unless the, 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 the government agency, the Mexican government, tries to step in and do something, you know, D agents, three D agents in, in Sinaloa aren't going to be able to do anything. So we need the cooperation of the Mexican government. And... Uh, we were fortunate to have the Mexican Marines at the time that Chapo was caught. So, I mean, that was, that was just great. It was a game changer. As a matter of fact, in, in my book, I, there's a chapter called Game Changer, and I speak about how we came, came to using the, the Marines or interacting with them and giving them intelligence so we can track down some of these high-level targets. Yeah, we want to definitely before we uh, wrap up, we want to definitely give you an opportunity to talk about your your projects, uh, your books, and and other projects you're involved in. Um, but I still have some some other uh, questions. Um, so the uh, the the UN's global report on on narcotics has come out recently. The State Department put out their report, and um, let me run some numbers by you guys and and see what you think. Um, one of the uh, bits of data that came out is that synthetic labs are rising dramatically in Mexico. They went from like usually maybe finding like a hundred a year to uh, several hundred now. And I'm guessing this is this is fentanyl. I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm and and when we say labs, we don't necessarily mean like a, a polished industrial. No, like, it, it could be a, a literally a. a, a what uh, not trailer or a, a recreational vehicle yeah, right, like a right. camper yes super, that is yeah. that's off in the woods and has been turned into a meth lab right right a, so yeah. so we so but but either way it's still capable of of, of manufacturing significant qual- qualities of um so is that, is that your understanding leo that the that the the labs are on the rise um in mexico right now well i, I would say in a way um i think some of those statistics are a little inflated because like you say if if you if you find a a cauldron in the middle of of the woods, you know they consider that a lab. So yeah, I, good I, point. Know, that's, that's not really a lab, man. You know, uh, but there are bigger labs. The more organized, like, like the Cartel de Jalisco, they have they have huge labs that they, they and they have a lot of land to put these labs in and hide them. I mean, Jalisco is a huge state, and then you have Michoacan, uh, you know, Colima, and, and there's endless amounts of acreage where they can set up a lab and nobody's going to find them, you know? So uh, they, I think they're ahead of the game, Cartel de Jalisco in, in transporting, bringing in, importing the, the, the precursors to make fentanyl in Mexico 
and then distribute it over here. I mean, m mass mass production of, of fentanyl. And as, as you can see, the statistics, man, you know, uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of people are, are dying from fentanyl each year. So, uh, yeah, they're they're mass producing this stuff, and especially Cartel Jalisco. I mean, they're producing fentanyl and meth methamphetamine. And uh, it's it's gotten to a point that it's scary. You know, I've given some talks here and people say, well, what can we do to, to protect our kids from this? And it's, it's hard, man, because, you know, I have a 10 year old granddaughter and uh, they get blasted every day by, you know, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube and Instagram and all these things, which we didn't have as kids growing up. So they have a lot more exposure to some of these things. And a lot of these traffickers are using those social media platforms to, to get at, at uh that kids and the ones that are at most risk. So, uh, you know, it's, it's dangerous out there for a kid. It's not the same as when we were growing up, you know? Yeah. I mean, even now, like, I know, like, even if you were like going to use cocaine or heroin or something recreationally, it might be cut with fentanyl and you don't yeah. even know, you don't, you know don't even what know you're what you're getting. You don't now. even know what you're taking. Yeah. Right. There, there was a sad story. I went to see this talk on fentanyl a couple of months ago. And uh, this lady, you know, we, we live right on, on the border here and, and her son went across the border to buy some medicine so he could sleep better. And uh, he bought it, took one pill and he didn't wake up. It was, it was laced with fentanyl. And here you have this uh, 18, 19 year old kid, his whole life ahead of him. And uh, you just go over there thinking you're buying a, a prescription drug. He didn't go to a pharmacy or nothing. I think he bought it on the street, but, but still, I mean, you're going there to buy you know, an oxy or something and it's laced with fentanyl and, and the next thing you know, you're dead, you know? So it's really dangerous. You, you can't take anything that's, that's sold on the street. You know, some of these drugs can be purchased online. And like I say, through social media, you know, they're selling stuff through social media now. So uh, it's, it's really hard. And as a parent, we got to be aware of these things, you know, that, that are going on. It's just so much different from when we were growing up. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, my understanding is that some policymakers are, I don't know how successful they will be, are trying to put more pressure on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok to do a better job of self-regulating um, to, to, to look out for these kinds of things. Because we, we know that the cartels have a presence on, online hmm. for recruiting. I mean, they don't even, it, in some cases, they don't try to veil it. Like, it's, it's pretty conspicuous. Well, I mean, making the- They have their own pages and stuff. Making the jump to terrorism, I mean- yeah, the greatest is, yeah. thing that ever happened to terrorist organizations was social media. Yeah, it's a recruiting tool in in mul at multiple levels. Yeah, that that's actually the more common way that they recruit now. It's yeah. not. It used to be like the mosque, right? Like, like a centralized. Right. Where they were, now it's you just you just recruit people online. You don't even have to be in the same community. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To to recruit someone. Speaking about recruiting, I also uh, read an article a couple of months ago that the cartels are now like Cartel de Jalisco and Sinaloa. They're going to universities in Mexico and recruiting students that are majoring in engineering and chemistry and stuff like that, and professors that are chemistry professors, science professors, stuff like that, to help them produce fentanyl in Mexico. And, and here's the, the goal that they want, is they want them, you want these uh, chemistry students and professors to help them, to help them uh, produce the, uh, the, the precursors. Yeah, so, so they, they don't, don't have, have to go to them, China. So they don't have to go to China. So they can keep more profits for themselves. So that's what they're recruiting these uh, highly intelligent folks to do. So it's, yeah, that's it's pretty scary, I, man. These guys, these guys are they're not they're not stupid. You know, they're, they're, they know what they're doing and they they know how to how to cut the bottom line. You know, and, and they, or in this case, expand their profits. Yeah, I'm glad you said. I, I was. I apologize for for interrupting, but yeah, my understanding is that. Right now, most of the precursors are coming from China, but as Leo pointed out, I was going to ask him about that. Is that they're getting close to developing the infrastructure where they don't have to, they don't Outsource. have to import, they don't have to import anymore, which which will be make will give them even more of an advantage in terms of escalating uh, production. So yeah, that would be that would be scary. Um, I, I want to ask you something else. I, I'm reading right now. Shout out to our friend Yoan Grillo. Uh, we'll try to have oh, yeah. him on again soon. A um, uh, great narco journalist in, in Mexico City. He's been on our show. Um, I'm reading his book, Gangster Warlords, right now, which I, I highly recommend. And he and he writes a lot about Central America. And my understanding is that there's some evidence that coca production is – there's actually some coca production in Central America. Usually it's, it's Bolivia, 
uh, Colombia, Peru, Peru, but but um, that some of it's in Central America. And the reason why that's significant is in terms of the immigration crisis, a lot of people assume it's all about Mexico. It's actually it's actually Central America is, is where the, the immigration crisis is starting. Right. Um, and, and specifically not all of Central America, specifically El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras. So if they do shift coca production, the, the gangs there will would be the beneficiaries of it. And the gangs in Central America work with the Mexican cartels. Um, so um, my understanding, Leo, is that um, the Zetas had a presence in Central America. And I was wondering during your times as an investigator, if Central America was like on your radar, well, what was your sense of what was going on down there? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, one of the leaders of the Zetas, Miguel Trevino, actually went to Central America, and uh, he had he instilled some of his uh, his lieutenants to oversee some of the operations there, and he he went down there with a plan, and I don't remember the guy's name right now, but where was in charge in Guatemala of the narcotics flow into Mexico and the United States, Trevino went over there and arranged a meeting, and once they they met up, he killed their whole crew. Killed them all. Wow. Took over just like that. He took over Guatemala and Central America. I mean, wow. they, these guys were not even prepared for something like that, man. You know, so and once he got control of that market, he he left his lieutenants in charge there. So yeah, these guys were you know they were pretty uh they were pretty uh you know they had a lot of foresight to see how they could make more money or or, or have more control of the trade. You know, so they wouldn't have to pay the guys in, in Guatemala or Honduras and, and like that. So they're just always looking to make more money somehow. And what better way than to have your own guys controlling Guatemala and Honduras? And, and that way you pay them, you don't pay another guy, you know? So it, it's very interesting. Uh, again, there's a chapter in my book covering that, that period where Trevino went in there and took these people out, you know, pretty much with the Setas. And they took control of Guatemala at the time. I don't know if they're still strong there. I don't believe so. But at the time, they were definitely. And so in terms of the current situation in Mexico, I want to get your expert opinion and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the projects you're working on. But um, so we've already established the Zetas and the the, the um, Gulf cartel are, 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 are on the ropes in a lot of ways. Um, my understanding is that the Knights Templar are sort of have, have also like on the ropes right now. Is that your understanding they, that they're they, still they, around, they heard- but they're not as significant? They pretty much got absorbed by Cartel de Jalisco. So, okay. I mean, either you come on board or you die. <laughs> it's that simple. So, so uh, the, the Cartel de Jalisco pretty much absorbed them into their organization. Okay, that that's that's what I was hearing. And, and by the way, the Knights Templar, that was a little bit closer to the ideological because they had this whole like kind of. And people said that they were insincere and they were disingenuous, but they had this like propaganda thing of like public relations that were protecting you from the cartels. Yeah. Uh, we're protecting you from corruption. Uh, do you remember that, Leo? That was part sure. of their, uh, again, I don't know how, I'm not an expert. I don't know how sincere or, or you know, genuine they were, but that was definitely part of their PR. I think, I think it was part of a, their, their ideal, you know. Uh, they actually had an ideal that they were trying to uphold. So, you know, and I, I didn't really work that organization that much. That, you know, our, our folks in Mexico City, were more focused on them, you know. I had my hands full with the setas, but <laughs> sure, understood. Yeah. Under, understood. You know, so, yeah. And then uh, Juarez cartel is still pretty significant. Is that correct? Well, back back when I was in in the DEA, the, the, the Juarez cartel was is very strong, you know, and, and uh, uh, it, it still is. I mean, we still have uh, a huge a huge Juarez cartel presence, you know, from right across the, the border from El Paso. And uh, sure, uh, you know, Amado Carrillo Fuentes, he was, he was the one that started the, the, Juarez, the Juarez faction there. So, and then we had Benjamin Arreano Felix up in, uh, in Tijuana. So we had all those people, all those cartels at the same time, you know, so it, it was pretty interesting. You know, those, those people are not in charge anymore, but I think remnants of that cartel still exist. Yeah. And, um, Something we talked about with you last time, and, and this actually does bring it back to more traditional organized crime. Something we talked about with Leo last time is something I think is really interesting, is that the cartel groups are diversifying, and they realize that it, it can't be just always about drugs. And and a lot of these uh, cartel groups are getting into human trafficking, extortion, 
owning casinos, uh, illegal mining, poaching, digital piracy, um, women. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Besides uh, human sex traffic. trafficking, yeah, yeah. You know, sex uh, trafficking, prostitution. Right. So, um, what, what do you what do you make of those trends? It, it seems like they're diversifying. Well, yeah, it's, it's nothing new. I, I mean, I, I saw that in Monterrey. You know, they're they're extorting business owners, uh, like you say, the, the, the sex trafficking, you know, the human trafficking. Uh, I even went to see there was this uh, a flea market down there, and these guys even uh, have bootleg uh, bootleg whiskey. You know. Wow. And other alcohol. I mean, if you're if you're a vendor and you're in that flea market and, and a set the member goes in there and doesn't see the the logo on your bottle that you're selling, you're gonna be in trouble because they're the ones that had control of all the, the liquor in in uh, in Monterrey. You know, so it's funny, but it's just another way of making money. Yeah, that's and some old a, school mafia. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a there's an a, there's an incident one time we with the Marines. The Marines a uh, they executed a search warrant in a warehouse, and it was packed to the gills with liquor, you know. And it was it was a the set the processing plant where they would put the logos on the bottles and and go ahead and sell them to the vendors. So, uh, and then after the vendors sell sell their their portion, well, they got to give a, a portion to to the setas, and that's that's how it works. So it's funny, but that's that's uh, one of their business interests. Yeah, and I was reading where some, uh, some, you know, because it's becoming more factional, that some of the factions are actually making a decision to scale back their drug trafficking because it's so violent and so dangerous, and that in some ways it's safer to just focus on some of these more traditional rackets. I don't know if you've if you've seen that too, Leo. Well, I, I think they're they've, they've scaled back, but on some particular types of drugs, for instance, cocaine. You still see a lot of cocaine coming in. There's still don't sure. get me wrong. But I think they're focusing more on the fentanyl and the methamphetamine because it's more profitable. So, I mean, they're going to pretty much marijuana. You hardly see it anymore. You know, not, not here in bulk quantities. We used to see thousands and thousands of pounds, you know, the tons and tons, you know. So, but you don't see that anymore. You see more, oh, they see 400 kilos of meth at the bridge the other day. Wow. I mean, in my day, if you seized one pound of meth, you were a hero. Now you're seeing 400 kilos at a time. You know, so it's it's mind boggling pretty much, you know, so I think they've changed their focus from the traditional type drugs like heroin and marijuana. And now they're focusing on the synthetic drugs, the opi opioids and the fentanyl and the methamphetamine. Yeah, I was um, also reading something the other day that we're talking about labs, even if they're crude, like, you know, in someone's apartment or something, one bedroom apartment or something. But that um, the cartels were trying to get their hands on some of the local producers in the United States because um, they have the advantage of them not having to sneak it across the border. If, if they control a lab already here in the United States, that gives you a significant advantage. You don't have to worry about it getting intercepted by, by Leo's agents or, or hijacked by a, by a rival cartel. Um, have you been hearing anything about that, Leo? Yeah, you, you hardly see any more labs here in the United States. I mean, at least not here or in my area, in my region. But Mexico is is the is the go to place for for those super labs. I'm talking yeah. about huge warehouses where they produce them in mass quantities. You know, so yeah, yeah it's very common down there. And it's again, it's it's all about profit. You know, the more they produce, the more money they make. So yeah, it make it makes sense. Um, well, Leo, tell us about. Um, I know the last time we we talked to you, you were working on a book. Tell us about some of your projects and and what you have going on. Right, I'm still not finished. I, I just I was gonna wrap it up but i i got asked so many questions on, on other interviews and, and podcasts about this one certain incident that i had when i was an agent here in mccallum and i decided to include it in my book so it's taking a little longer than uh, than, than i expected but it, it and i'll give it to you in a nutshell i was running a task force here in, in mccallum before i got sent to monterrey and uh we targeted this guy named carlos landin martinez el puma and after like two or three years of, of investigating him and his whole organization, we could never find him. I mean, we ran operations with our, our state troopers here. We had helicopters in the sky. We had airplanes and all this, uh, you know, high tech electronic equipment to try and track him down. And we never could. So one day I'm having a family barbecue and my wife says, hey, you know, you didn't buy corn for the for the barbecue. I said, oh, shit, well, let me go to the store and, and get some corn out, get some ice for the beer, too, right? So <laughs> I'm in the, the produce section looking at the corn, and who walks by me? 
Carlos Landy Martinez. Oh, we wow. locked eyes, man. We <laughs> locked eyes. And I said, it can't be him. It, it convinced me that it was him was there was two, two like bodyguards taking care of him. They were kind of like protecting him. So when I'm looking at the corn and I'm, I'm in shock because I see him just pass by me. He goes to the watermelon section and, and, uh, <laughs> and buys a watermelon, selects a watermelon, looks at it and buys a watermelon. You know, my wife sent me for corn and probably his wife sent him for watermelon. So I started following him. And at the time, well, you know, DA policy says you can't use your official government vehicle for personal errands. So I, I took my wife's car, which was a, a Ford Escort with a <laughs> Hello Kitty sticker on the back. You know? <laughs> and I started following him in my wife's car, you know, and, and I said, man, if these guys see me following, they're going to make Swiss cheese out of me, man. And uh, <clears throat> turns out that I, I got on the radio and, uh, and uh, called my, my, uh, my task force officer from McCallum PD and, and he sent me a unit and they were able to stop him. And it was him, Carlos Landi Martinez, you know, and, and, and you know, he, uh, he went to jail and never got out. He got life in prison. He went to trial and he got life in prison. So I'm always asked about that incident, you know, on some of these, these shows and podcasts. And, and I decided to include that in my book. So, so that, that's where I'm at right now with that. And uh, That's a movie. But, yeah, that's, that's like just, a scene for just totally. That one. You can make a whole movie out of that day in your yeah. life. That, that's yeah. like a scene in a movie where, where you're watching it and you'd be like, well, that would never happen. Right. That, that's obviously a movie. That would never happen in real life. And, it did and, happen, man. And it, it, it's Carlos Nandine. And, and to, to make things even funnier, I was wearing my DEA shirt. You know, DEA. <laughs> that's he, great. Houston Field Division and has the eagle right here on my shirt and everything. <laughs> He didn't catch on to it, man. So, <laughs> wow, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So anyway, so that that's the delay. That's the reason for the delay. I'm I'm adding that chapter. I, I feel like I owe it to the people that have been listening to some of these shows to, to put it in there. So, you know, it's it's a great story, and I, I think I had to put it in that book. So that's where we are right now. No, for sure. And I don't know if you're at liberty to to say yet, or if you want to discuss. But um, do you have a book deal yet, or are you going to shop it around, or what what stage are you at? No, I, I did sign with a with a publishing company out of oh, California, great. so, so uh, I'm on board with them, and uh, they're just waiting for me, man, to finish it up. So I gotta, I gotta get going and get cracking and finish that story. And did Hollywood buy the rights to this yet? <laughs> <laughs> I hope they do. Not yet. I mean, so we'll see. We'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, well, we wish you well, and and we hope that um, you know when the book is ready, you know, you'll come back on again and and give us an update on things. Definitely, absolutely. And uh, so anything else did you want to promote, Leo? I mean, I know you're on social media, but you're just doing your thing? Just just uh, keeping my ear to the ground and, and, and you know, keeping tabs on what's happening down there in Mexico, especially with all these kidnappings. So, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. Well, we appreciate your insight, Leo. We appreciate your time and we look forward to reading your book. And uh, thanks again for, uh, for coming on and, and, and talking about this really important uh, topic. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you guys asking me to be on Thank the show. Thank you, Leo. You've I'm done it all. You've said it all. You've, you've literally, <laughs> I say this to so many guests, but it's true. You've lived a movie script, and we're <laughs> lucky to, to have you uh, as a guest to, to share little bits and pieces of your life uh, with us and our, and our audience. I, I, yeah. The story that you just told, yeah, that was like, fantastic. I feel like we could put that into a five-minute little bit and, and put it out on the internet, Social and just media, that yeah, five we, minutes would go uh, viral. That, that is a great story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, Thank anyway, you, we did get to eat the corn that day, but he didn't get his watermelon. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thanks again, Leo. Uh, good luck with everything, and I'll, and I'll stay in touch. And we'll, we'll especially during the NFL season, you and I, All right. you and I will talk. Go boys. Okay. All right. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, everyone, thanks, for thanks, listening. Uh, please follow us on social media and subscribe. And uh, original Gangsters Podcast, Jimmy Scott B. Bernstein. Scott Bernstein, we're out. <laughs>